It's a great pleasure to be with you here at the National Press Club on Ngunnawal land. I would like to pay my respects to Ngunnawal uh, elders, past, present and emerging, and to all First Nations people here today and joining us remotely. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of many of those who are in the room who have supported Joyn Assange and his family over the years, and in particular, the members of the Joyn Assange Parliamentary Friends Group, Senators Peter Wish Wilson, David Shoebridge, the member for Kuyong, the Honourable Monique Ryan, and from the Labor Party, Susan Templeman MP. So thank you for being here. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, special guests, including Bernard Kaliri, whose endurance, courage, and integrity inspires so many of us, myself included. And David McBride, the whistleblower still facing trial, who remains the only person facing charges many years after the Brereton report. I've been working on Julian Assange's defence and talking about its implications for democracy and free speech for over a decade. You might have heard some of, media, some of the media sound bites from me over, the, over those years about the stark injustice it is that Julian Assange faces 175 years in prison for committing acts of journalism, about how the United States seeks to imprison him for the rest of his life for publications which have won the Walkley Award for Most Outstanding Contribution to Journalism and the Sydney Peace Prize Medal. You might have heard me say that his prosecution sets a dangerous precedent for free speech and journalists all over the world. But having an opportunity like this to elaborate is rare, and so I want to thank the National Press Club for the invitation and having me here today. I'm often asked how Julian is, and so I think it's right that I start there. I really don't know how much longer he can last. The world was shocked by his appearance when he was arrested back in 2019. I wasn't. For over seven years, I had been watching his health slowly decline inside the Ecuadorian embassy where he was seeking to protect himself from US extradition. After years of government statements and media commentary claiming Julian was paranoid and should just leave the embassy, some were surprised when Julian was served immediately with a US extradition request when he was arrested. I wasn't because it was exactly what we were warning about for more than a decade. For the past three and a half years, Julian Assange has been in a high security prison, Belmarsh, known as the Guantanamo of the UK, and I've watched his health decline even further. Just last year, after a particularly stressful court hearing, Julian had a mini stroke. As the prosecution was deriding the medical evidence of Julian's severe depression and suicidal ideation and the risk to his life, those with video access saw Julian sitting in a blue room in Belmarsh with his head in his hands. Now, I've seen Julian on some particularly bad days, but this was alarming. And my alarm was for good reason. As it turned out, he had just had, or was experiencing as we watched live on the screen, a mini stroke, which often precedes a major stroke. Once again, we were witnessing in real time Julian's health decline. Julian's wife, Stella, who speaks so eloquently on his behalf now that he can't, anxiously waits for the phone call that she dreads. And it is no exaggeration to say, when she does say this to the media and regularly, that he is suffering profoundly in prison and she doesn't know if he's going to survive it. Unless a political resolution is found, this case, as we all know, has always been political it requires a political solution. And if we don't find one, Julian is going to be detained for many, many years to come. It is impossible to accurately predict the timeline, but here is a brief overview of where we are in terms of the legal process and where we, what the legal process ahead might look like. After a year long extradition hearing, which was interrupted a number of times because of COVID, Julian won his case in early January, 2021. If extradited to the United States, he will be placed in prison conditions which are known as Special Administrative Measures, or SAMs. These have been described as the darkest black hole of the US prison system. The magistrate ruled that Julian's extradition would be oppressive because of the prison conditions he would face, and the medical evidence shows that if subjected to SAMs, he will suicide. And on that basis, she barred his extradition. But the Trump administration appealed and in its last days sought to get around that court decision by shifting the goalposts. 
by offering an assurance that Julian would not be placed in such oppressive prison conditions. But as Amnesty International has said, US assurances are not worth the paper that they're written on. And in Julian's case, it's even worse than that. The US assurance was in fact conditional. The US only promised not to place him in SAMS unless he did something later that would deserve him being placed under SAMS. And who would decide those prison, prison conditions? The CIA, and he would have no right of appeal. Before the US government was heard, the US government appeal was heard, we learned, thanks to important investigative journalism, that the CIA had planned to kidnap and kill Julian. I think it's worth pausing on that for a moment. The CIA had planned to kidnap and kill an award-winning journalist in London. Again, the Central Intelligence Agency had plans in place to send someone to London to kidnap and assassinate Julian Assange. We know this because of an investigation based on interviews with at least 30 different official government sources. When the news broke, I thought, finally, this is the thing that will put the case to an end. This will be it. But no, a British court accepted the US assurance, despite the fact we were not able to challenge it in court with evidence, and ordered and it said that his extradition could go ahead. In June, the British Secretary, Home Secretary ordered his extradition. We've since filed an appeal and we're waiting to hear, and we should hear soon, whether the High Court will grant us permission and hear that appeal. If it does, we can expect a process that goes on for years through the High Court and all the way to the UK Supreme Court. If we lose, we will appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. That is, of course, if the current British Conservative government doesn't remove its jurisdiction before we have that opportunity. If our appeal fails, Julian will be extradited to the United States, where his prison conditions will be at the whim of the intelligence agency that plotted to kill him. He will face an unfair trial, and once convicted, it could take years before wherever we ever get the opportunity to run a constitutional argument under the First Amendment before the US Supreme Court. That is another decade of his life gone, if he can survive that long. And that's why I'm here. This case needs an urgent political fix. Julian does not have another decade of his life to wait for a legal fix. And it might be surprising to hear that from me as a lawyer, that the solution is not a legal one. It is a political one. So when you hear politicians or government officials in the UK or in the US or in this country talk about due process or the rule of law, this is what they're talking about. Punishment by process, burying him under legal process until he dies. In fact, if you look at the case and you read our grounds of appeal, there's been very little by way of due process or rule of law in what has been inflicted upon Julian. As we argue in our appeal, this case has been rife with an abuse. And let me just outline a few of those abuse of process. This case against him is unprecedented. It is the first time in US legal history that a journalist is facing prosecution under the Espionage Act for committing acts of journalism. And the US is going to argue that Julian Assange, as an Australian citizen, is not entitled to free speech constitutional protections at all. Then we get to the US-UK extradition treaty. That treaty prohibits uh, extraditing anyone for political offences. And yet the US is purporting to extradite Julian under the Espionage Act, which is, of course, a political offence. That, we say, is unlawful and an abusive process. We've seen the fabrication of evidence against him. The US key witness in Iceland has since admitted that he lied, and yet the US is continuing to pursue an indictment based on his evidence. We've also seen that the indictment deliberately misrepresents the facts in order to secure his extradition. We've seen the un unlawful surveillance of Julian, of myself personally, of our legal team, on his medical treatment and the seizure of le legally privileged material. At the extradition hearing, we heard evidence from the revered leaker of the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg, who celebrated the world over for that public interest publication about the Vietnam War. Ellsberg explained that his prosecution by the Nixon administration under the Espionage Act was thrown out with prejudice for far less abuse than what we have seen in Julian Assange's case. And yet, 
This prosecution continued and was commenced and continued under the Trump administration and it continues today under President Biden. What does that say about our civil liberties and our democracies in 2022? The list of abuse goes on and on and on, but I don't want to take up all day talking about that. As a lawyer working on human rights cases, it's important to remain focused on the principles at stake and the work at hand. An essential part of my job is to remain dispassionate and level-headed in the face of injustice. But it has become harder and harder to do so, watching the persecution that Julian has faced and the impact that it is having on his family and on him as a human being and as a fellow Australian. In 2019, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Meltzer, reported his findings on Julian's case and concluded that he had been subjected to torture. To torture. Years before, we had made a complaint to his UN mandate and we had heard nothing back. It was only later that Melsa acknowledged that it was he had ignored our complaint and had not responded to it because of the prejudice he felt against Julian after years of government propaganda and media reporting which attacked Julian's reputation. But in 2019, he finally agreed to read our complaint and what he read shocked him and forced him to confront his own prejudice. He's since written a book about it, what he learned, and we have it here today, so I'm going to show it to you. The Trial of Julian Assange, and I highly recommend it. But in his UN findings, this is how Mr. Melser put it, and I quote, In 20 years of work with victims of war, violence and political persecution, I have never seen a group of democratic states ganging up to deliberately isolate, demonise and abuse a singular individual for such a long time and with so little regard for human dignity and the rule of law. So it hasn't always been easy to remain dispassionate in the face of his persecution and in particular the impact on Julian and his family. Julian has two small children, Gabriel and Max, who are just five and three. When they tell me about going to see their dad in the queue, they're talking about going to visit him in Belmarsh prison. They call it the queue because of the security queue that they have to stand in, their little bodies patted down by guards, their mouths checked, their ears checked, in their hair, in their shoes, before they're allowed to see their father. This is heartbreaking. Because of COVID restrictions, Julian was not able to see his family for six months. And when they were finally allowed into the prison, ongoing prison restrictions meant that he wasn't allowed to touch his children or even give them a cuddle. Try explaining that to your kids when you haven't seen them for six months. And this is heartbreaking. Last week, thousands of people linked hands together to form a human chain around British Parliament in an inspiring protest to, to demand Julian's freedom. The kids came to the protest and I walked with them around the chain saying hello to people and they were wearing their Free My Dad t-shirts and chanting along with the crowd, free, free Julian Assange. This is heartbreaking. I say this because I think it's important to remind everyone of the very real human consequences of this case and the suffering, not just for Julian, but his family. But what is he in, act in prison for? And why are he and his family being put through this? The events that led to Julian's indictment started in a room just like this one. On the 5th of April 2010, at the National Press Club in Washington DC, WikiLeaks shared the collateral murder video for the first time. It put WikiLeaks and Julian on the map in all kinds of ways. As you know, it showed the murder of civilians, children and journalists by US forces in Iraq. A war crime, which the US authorities then tried to cover up. An Australian journalist, Dean, J Dean Yates, was the head of Reuters in Iraq at that time, and he saw answers from the US authorities about what had happened to his colleagues. The US claimed that their forces had complied with their rules of engagement. That was a lie, and freedom of information requests were for the information that would have proved that lie were denied. It was only after that video and the rules of engagement were published by WikiLeaks that the world learned the truth about what had actually happened to those journalists. And I want to emphasize here 
that Julian is being prosecuted for public publishing evidence about the murder of your journalist colleagues in Iraq. After the release of collateral murder came the Afghan war diaries, the Iraq war logs and the State Department cables. In each of these releases, WikiLeaks pioneered global collaborations with journalists around the world. Working together with WikiLeaks and journalists from mainstream media organisations, they analysed large sets of data, identifying patterns and trends to understand, what, to understand what was really happening and to tell that story. And what did we learn from those publications? We learned that thousands more civilians were being killed in American wars than the US government had ever acknowledged. They showed evidence of war crimes and torture by US forces, Western governments and their autocratic regime allies. They revealed the dense networks of support between those governments and major corporations which drive our trade and foreign policies. Journalism like this, at its core, is about subjecting power to scrutiny to power, sorry, subjecting power to scrutiny and holding it accountable. And the powerful didn't like it. WikiLeaks was responsible for hundreds, perhaps thousands of stories around the world about how power really works in Washington, in Canberra, in London, and in capitals around the world. They showed us what it means on the streets and in the homes of people in countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, and about the price that's paid for the application of that power in shattered lives and dead and broken bodies. Rather than shame, WikiLeaks provoked rage, rage that journalism was exposing the powerful. The Obama administration opened a criminal investigation which Australian diplomats reported was unprecedented in size and scale. But the Obama administration did not indict Julian. Their concern was with the so-called New York Times problem. That is, that prosecuting Julian would mean criminalising what the New York Times does every single day. But we ended up with a president, President Trump, who had no such qualms. After all, he had called the media the enemy of the people and said he wanted to see reporters in prison. And the result is an indictment against Julian, which describes and criminalizes routine journalistic practices. But let's not forget that Trump was willing to play politics with this prosecution. Back in 2017, before Julian had been indicted by the US, a congressman came to visit Julian in the Ecuadorian embassy. He came to offer Julian a political deal. I had been asked by Julian to attend and observe that meeting, and I later gave evidence about it at the extradition hearing. This was at the height of the Mueller investigation about Russian interference in the, U in the US election in 2016. President Trump was then a subject of that investigation. Julian had already made clear publicly that the WikiLeaks publications in the context of the 2016 election had not come from a government source, but Trump clearly wanted to know more. Congressman Dana Rohrabacher made clear on his visit that President Trump was aware of and had approved of him coming to make this proposal. It was what he called a win-win solution that would allow Julian to get on with his life. Julian was asked to identify the source, his source, for the 2016 publications, which the congressman explained would solve President Trump's problems and put an end to the Mueller investigation. In return, Julian would receive a pardon or some form of protection that he would not be extradited to the United States. And of course, Julian refused to identify his source. A publisher's promise to their sources is solemn, as many of you in this room will know, even if that promise carries a cost. Trump too made good on his promise. His, in, his administration indicted Julian after he refused to name that source. Julian has had many other opportunities to put himself in his own interests above the interests of democracy and free speech, and he has always put himself second. And the result is an indictment against him, which threatens free speech and democracy. The Freedom of the Press Foundation calls this prosecution the most terrifying threat to freedom of speech in the 21st century. And this is no exaggeration. One of the 18 charges relates to taking measures to protect the identity of a source. The remaining 17 charges are all brought under the Espionage Act, and they relate to receiving and publishing information, 
there is no public interest defence to charges under the Espionage Act. And around the world, the media has responded. The Guardian, the New York Times, the Washington Post have all made clear their concern about this prosecution and the fact that it is criminalising public interest journalistic practices that they employ every day. As the President of the International Federation of Journalists herself said just this week, if Julian Assange is jailed in the US, there is not a journalist on earth who will be safe. And she is right. If Julian is extradited, the precedent means that any journalist or editor anywhere in the world who published truthful information about the United States could face extradition and prosecution for committing acts of journalism. Would we stand by and accept this if it was Russia or China trying to do the same? I want to make a few uh, concluding remarks about Julian's future, about what the Australian government can do and about what you in the room can do. Those who resolve Julian's case by securing his release from prison will be remembered well in the books that will be written about it. They will be on the right side of history. Australians remember well who brought David Hicks home. We remember well who got Peter Grester, Melinda Taylor and James Rickardson out of overseas prisons. We remember well who got Kylie Moore Gilbert out of Iran recently. And if we can put to an end an espionage case against an Australian citizen in Iran, then we can do it in respect of an equally outrageous espionage prosecution in the United States. What a great day it was, that day that Kylie was brought home and was free. I look forward to another great day when this Australian Prime Minister and this government gets Julian out of prison. For more than a decade, we have been making this ask of the Australian government. We have had nothing but silence and complicity by consecutive Australian governments on both sides of politics. Not one Australian government has had the courage to ask our ally to do the right thing to protect this Australian citizen and journalist. We now have a prime minister who has said, and I quote, enough is enough. Prime Minister Albanese has said, and again I quote, I fail to see what purpose is being served by the ongoing incarceration of Julian Assange. A heavy price has been paid. And I couldn't agree with him more. But now we need to see action. We all want to see our Prime Minister stand up at the press conference taking questions about Julian's release from prison rather than his death in custody. And what will help the government bring this case to a close? You, the journalists in the room, you above all people are able to, to differentiate between publishing and espionage a distinction that the US government and its allies is trying to erase. You, above all people, have the unique opportunity and the responsibility of facing the Prime Minister and his colleagues every day. You can ask what's being done and when it is that we'll see Julian brought home. Ask them this, the Prime Minister, the Attorney General, the Foreign Minister, at every press conference until Julian is released from prison. Because if we don't see that day, Julian Assange will not be the last of your colleagues to have his life destroyed in this line of work. And what else will help force our government to do the right thing and bring Julian Assange home? You, the public, protest, write to your MP, write to the Prime Minister, turn up at their offices and demand action. Working for democratic accountability is why Julian Assange is sitting in a high security prison today. And I believe that democratic accountability can help to get him out of it. So hold our government to account and let's bring Julian Assange home. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, you talked about how this requires a political solution now, not one that can be sorted out in the courts, and that um, uh, various people, including Anthony Albanese and Penny Wong, have said enough is enough. Um, it's not clear whether they've actually advocated either privately or publicly to the Americans about this, as, as you indicate 
I was just wondering um, what what are the implications? I mean, you talked um, in brief about um, the Biden presidency. Is there any reason to believe that there might be a change from the Trump position, from the Biden administration? And what sort of risk is there if, as some predict, um, Donald Trump is returned to the White House at the next election? We certainly hope to see a change in the Biden administration. Uh, this prosecution runs completely counter to the Biden administration's own policies on the treatment of journalists and, and free speech principles. We are in a, a, an, an ironic and strange position where you have a president who wants to close Guantanamo, but his Department of Justice is prosecuting the person responsible for the publications that made the policy position he now adopts about the closing of Guantanamo possible. And so it's, it's really, I think, why it is an opportune moment for the Australian government to have these conversations. The Obama administration chose not to indict for that reason, and it's time the Biden administration adopts the same position and puts an end to it. What, what uh, is the relative role of um, the sort of, shall we say, the national security establishment in the US? I mean, you've talked about the incredibly alarming revelations about the CIA, uh, but how much do you think this is being driven by that national security establishment um, and how does that work in with the administration? Um, well, we do know that there, there was a possibility, and this is public, that Julian was on President Trump's list for pardons at the end of his presidency. and. The reports are that it was put to a stop by by Mike Pompeo, who was um, then the head of the CIA. So um, I do think that there is a, the driving force is the intelligence agencies, um, and that is a concern. But this is a free speech question. He's a journalist. He is a publisher. It shouldn't be up to the intelligence agencies to make that decision. Next question is from Tim Shaw. Thanks, Laura, and uh, thank you so much, Jennifer Robinson, for supporting free speech, freedom of journalism and protection of the truth. Um, it's over 10 years ago since I spoke to Julian, um, before he went into the Ecuadorian embassy. And he spoke about that meeting that you had with Nicola Roxon, the then Attorney General of the Commonwealth. Um, we'd heard from Senator Bob Carr, these ministers of the time were only as good as the information that they were briefed with. Is it your view and Julian's view as his lawyer that in 2022, we're getting the kind of clearer, better and more honest information to our politicians. It's not a legal matter now, as you said, it's political. But can you reflect on that time in 2010 when you met with Nicola Roxon in 2012 and fast forward now to Attorney General Dreyfus's remarks, Senator Penny Wong's remarks, and certainly what you've just quoted from Prime Minister Albanese, both Labor governments. Thank you, Tim, for your question. Uh, we are, we've seen a sea change in approach from, from the Australian government with this Australian government. Now, we've been working on this for a long time. We've been coming to Canberra to brief members of parliament. Um, the position could not be clearer now that the US has, in fact, indicted him. Back then, we were worried about the potential indictment, but it wasn't clear. We, could, we weren't in a position to know whether it was there or not because of the secret nature of the process. Now we, it's there, it's there for all to see. We can see the stark injustice that it is. And it is wonderful that we now have an Australian Prime Minister who is saying enough is enough, but we now need to see him take action on that. So I find it encouraging as Julian's lawyer that we have a government willing to have these talks with the United States. The content of those talks I'm not privy to, but we certainly hope to see progress and progress soon because as I said, Julian's health won't won't last much longer. UK extradition between the United States was described as very one-sided by Lord Jonathan Sumption. I'd just like you to reflect on that uh, and what your thoughts are on the Australian US extradition arrangements. I th there's, a, there's a huge concern in the, United in the United Kingdom about the imbalanced nature of the treaty between the US and the UK. For example, the United States would never extradite someone for a political offence, for prosecution for a political offence in the United Kingdom, and yet the UK seems intent on allowing it in this case. And that causes concern, not just for us as Julian's lawyers, but for, for many who believe in civil liberties and the protection of British citizens um, from political persecution. Um, but unfortunately, we are lumped with the treaty and the extradition act that we have. Uh, and of course, there is still this is still a legal case. While I believe the solution will be political, we will use every legal me mechanism available to us as his legal team. What I just want people to acknowledge is that that is going to tie us up in legal process for the next decade or longer.
and that's not acceptable. Thank you, today, Thank you. David Crow. Thanks, Laura. Uh, David Crow from the City Morning Herald and The Age of Melbourne. Thanks, Ms Robinson, for your speech. Um, I want to ask you about the Australian government's position and uh, what they've said in recent months. You've quoted from Anthony Albanese and his remarks in December of last year, before he became Prime Minister, clearly. Since then, whenever asked, including at a doorstop that I was at in, I think, in the first week after he took office, his argument is always that uh, whatever he, he stands by his former comments, um, that is enough, enough is enough, uh, but he's not going to engage in further comment in public. That's also the kind of response that we've seen from Penny Wong as foreign minister in recent months, and we also heard it here in this room from Mark Dreyfus as Attorney General last week. Do you accept that it's better for the Australian government to not make any public comment and to do all its work in private with the US government or with the British government? Or do you think that that's actually not getting results and that we should expect our Prime Minister and our ministers to speak publicly about what they think should happen? Well, I think the Australian government has made its position clear that enough is enough. That is a public statement. And that, of course, this is a case that's going to require private diplomatic negotiation and allowing time for them to do that. We hope that they are doing what they say they are going to do, which is to bring it to an end. We're obviously not privy to those conversations, but of course there is a place for both private talks and public advocacy. And I think the Australian public demands action and wants to hear from our leaders that they are taking the steps they need to bring it to an end. So we have to give them an opportunity to resolve it. This has already gone on for a decade. It's not a straightforward matter and we'll continue to press the government to do more. Okay. But that's all I can say. I'm not privy to those conversations. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Kylie, uh, Kylie Moore Gilbert. I think, was there, a, was there a situation with Kylie Moore Gilbert where, she was, where the people around her were encouraged in, at, at first not to speak up because it was regarded as being counterproductive if that happened? In the end, people did speak up and it helped get a result. I mean, do you think in the case of Kylie Moore Gilbert that speaking up was fundamental to actually getting an outcome? Look, there's a place for, like I said, there's a place for public advocacy and private advocacy and negotiation. We will certainly continue to put our case very publicly and we'll continue to call on the Australian government to do more. And that's what all we can do as his legal team. Thanks. Mary Costakidis. Uh, Jennifer, Mary Costakidis, freelancer. Thank you very much for your 12 year advocacy of Julian. And thank you particularly for appealing to journalists today, to the press. One of the criticisms of Julian that's uh, often used to undermine what he and WikiLeaks achieved is that he's not a journalist. Uh, the US in their indictment uh, have attempted to differentiate between what WikiLeaks did and, um, and, and real journalism. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that, the charges that uh, uh, aim to achieve that differentiation, because we know that the US's main witness has been discredited. He outed himself by saying he lied to the FBI, and, and yet there hasn't been much coverage of that. Thank you, Mary. Um, I am so tired of this point and hearing it from journalists actually that Julian is not a journalist. He is a card carrying member of your media union who describe him and consider him as a journalist. What more do you need than that? And in any event, as a lawyer, legal protection applies to journalistic activity. So whether or not you define someone as a journalist, the protection applies to journalistic activity. If you want to get into an argument about who or who is not defined as a journalist, you are going down the same path of countries like Russia and China. It is a dangerous road to go down. And this is why it's so important that journalists remember this. Legal protection applies to journalistic activity. If Julian's actions were, Julian's actions were journalistic activity, the same kinds of practices that journalists engage in every day, receiving, possession and publication of government information. That is what's being criminalised in this case. By Julian being prosecuted, it is setting a, pro a precedent that will apply to each and every one of you. So if you want to stand back and say, he's not a journalist, I'm not going to advocate for him, you are literally shooting yourself in the foot and undermining your own protections as a journalist and as someone who engages in journalistic activity.
Also, just one more question, and that's about due process, because we, that's all we've heard from politicians, uh, that we can't really intervene because there's a legal process happening and we have to uh, stand back and allow due process to take place. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who observed his extradition hearings and the appeal process online, uh, I thought it was extraordinary that an Australian citizen, a publisher, an editor, was not allowed, not permitted to sit with his legal team, was sitting in a glass box at the back of the court where he couldn't confer with his legal team. And when he attempted to, when I saw when you walked up and tried to con uh, confer with him, he had to shout so that everyone else uh, was able to hear him as well. One other thing that's not not known because it's not familiar to us in our legal system is that in the US and and this evidence was presented at his extradition mm -hmm. trial in the United States stakeholders have a say in sentencing conditions so the conditions that he would be held in the CIA who we know uh, plotted to murder him will have a say in the conditions he is held in so could you tell us, from your perspective, the ways in which due process hasn't been followed? Like I said, it w I would be here all day describing to you all the ways due process has not been respected. Um, I'm interested to speak about what it's like to be in court with Julian, as Mary described. Uh, he's kept in a glass box at the, at the back of the court. Um, so if, when things happen in court where he wants to give us instructions, which happens regularly, he has to try to get our attention or he's trying to, sh to speak to me through thick glass, which means not only can I hear him, but the prosecutors sitting opposite me can hear him. So we actually have no way of being able to speak in a, in a privileged, confidential way during the course of the proceedings. And it, and it, and it has a, a real impact on our ability to properly defend him. But just a few words about the due process or so-called due process he'll face in the United States. If he's extradited to the United States, he'll face trial in, in uh, East Virginia, which is a, will be a jury made up of um, former intelligence agents or intelligence agents. That is where the CIA, the NSA uh, are all located. Um, the, the process and the nature of the charging in the United States means that there's a 97% plea bargain rate um, in that jurisdiction. Um, he is very likely, to, we have no hope that he will not be convicted um, and then he's stuck in process in the United States for a very long time. And I want to make the point too that a lot of people throw about this idea that was part of the assurance that the US said, well, he can go and serve his sentence in Australia uh, once he's uh, convicted in this jurisdiction. That is no solution at all because what that means is that he will have to go to the United States, potentially be placed in prison conditions that will cause his suicide. If he makes it through the appeal processes all the way to the Supreme Court, only after that could we apply to try to get him home to Australia. And he won't last that long. So when you hear a government official roll that out as a solution, remember it is no solution at all. James Rickardson. Uh, James Rickardson. <clears throat> I was um, for 15 months jailed in Cambodia as a spy. And the first person that helped me with advice was Julian Assange via a, a, um, a, a smartphone that had been smuggled into the prison. So I have a, a personal reason for wanting to support Julian and also a reason as a member of the Fourth Estate. Um, a couple of points I'd like to make. One is, which is reiterating what you've said, Jennifer, is that in my case, Malcolm Turnbull, the then Prime Minister of Australia. Is this, is this going to be a question? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm just, it is, it is going to be a question. Okay. Asked, um, did a deal with Hun Sen, the Prime Minister of, of, of Cambodia, um, to secure my release after I'd been found guilty and, and, and been sentenced. My question then is, why is it that the Australian government persists in saying that they cannot intervene in the case of Australian citizens that are in trouble, legal trouble, when it's clear from my case, from um, Kylie Moore Gilbert's case and Peter Grest's and others, that they can intervene. Thank you, James, for being here and for your question. Um, consular assistance is a very nebulous term. It effectively means, it can mean anything from providing you a list of lawyers and saying good luck, um, to visit, visiting you on the odd occasion in prison. It is not a solution 
to cases like yours or to a solution to Julian Assange's case. So when you hear the Australian government talk about consular assistance, it can mean many things. It can mean next to nothing, and it can mean engaging in the way that Malcolm Turnbull did on your behalf. And that is precisely what we need to see happen for Julian Assange. We need Prime Minister Albanese to be on the phone to President Biden and to get this sorted out. Thank you. Um, just uh, following that through a little bit, Jen, um, you mentioned some of the various people uh, who've got caught up in processes over the years, David Hicks, um, that, um, uh, um, Mr Grester, <laughs> I'm having a senior moment, uh, all sorts of other people. Can you see any trend in, um, in whether it's got better or worse in terms of government interventions from Australia, or is it still just basically a case-by-case -case question? I think those cases all show what the Australian government can do when properly motivated. Um, our intervention in cases of Australians detained abroad is entirely political, it always is, and it depends on the politics of the moment and the politics of the particular government. That's why it's so important to have a Prime Minister saying what he's saying now uh, and the Attorney General acknowledging that they're having these talks. It is something that the Australian government can do. We've seen it happen in other cases and they can do it in this one. Nick Stewart. Following on from Laura's question, uh, we, we had a situation at the turn of the century where there was this incredibly positive feeling about the way law was working and, and the way the, the world was coming together. Since then, we've seen this division, obviously along religious grounds and, and um, also state grounds, ideological grounds, but also within the Western world. We've, we've seen this division between the national security concerns and the ideological or the, the libertarian concerns. To what extent do you feel that the, um, you know, for want of a better word, the right wing, the security concerns have overtaken natural libertarian principles? Thank you for your question. Um, the implementation of national security legislation in this country alone is terrifying. The amount of criminal um, offences that have been created to prosecute people for publishing national defence information, even if it's in the public interest, is terrifying. We would never have accepted that before. But in a post 9-11 world, we're seeing a creeping, I think, incursion on our civil liberties. Whether we talk about unlawful surveillance and surveillance on all of us as citizens, whether we talk about types of offences that are being implemented and pursued against journalists. Let's not forget that the ABC in this country um, was had a criminal prosecution held over their head because of public interest information that was leaked to them by a very brave whistleblower. Um, this wouldn't, we would never have accepted that before. We would never have accepted an Australian citizen being held in prison and facing life in prison for publications that he's won journalism awards for. And we have to resist the normalisation of this treatment of an Australian citizen and journalist because this will become the norm if we let it be. How can we turn this back? Bring Julian Assange home as a starting point would be great. <laughs> Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Tranter. Hi, Jen. Hi, Kelly. Declassified Oz. Thank you for your address and your tireless advocacy for as long as I can remember. I have a, um, just a very brief question. You've said that you've been asking successive Australian governments for diplomatic assistance for Julian for over a decade, but successive Australian governments have done nothing. Mm. The Albanese government has said that enough is enough and they refer to quiet diplomacy. But FOI documents received by Declassified Oz from the Attorney General's office confirm that a post-extradition plea deal is still being considered notwithstanding the dire personal consequences for Julian of landing on US soil and for journalists in this room and the world over. Do you think quiet diplomacy is effective when Mr Assange's position has not substantially changed in any way since the election in May? With over a decade of inaction by successive Australian governments, are you confident that representations are actually being made to the United States that no extradition take place and should Mr Albanese meet with Mr Assange's family? Thank you. Uh, first, I do think that the Prime Minister should meet with Julian's family. It would be a welcome um, gesture and one that I think the Australian public would fully support. 
in terms of all I can say is what I have been told that private talks are underway. Um, for us, any kind of post extradition agreement would be unacceptable as an outcome. It is, as I have explained, no solution. Um, we cannot allow Julian to be sent to the United States to face those those prison conditions. Uh, we know that there's there's medical evidence to show that he will suicide if he's placed in those conditions, and that is not an acceptable outcome for any Australian citizen. Ebony Bennett. Thank you, Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. Jennifer, you've talked a lot about the threat to freedom of the press by the prosecution of Julian Assange. You just kind of mentioned the raids on journalists that we've seen here in Australia, and Australia has slipped down the World Press Freedom Index as well. We've also got Bernard Clary in the room. We've seen not only whistleblowers prosecuted, but their legal representatives as well. How concerned are you about Australia's system of protection, not only for press freedom, but for whistleblowers and their lawyers? And how would you like to see that strengthened? Thank you. Um, well, of course, as a lawyer for, for someone who works with whistleblowers, to watch a colleague uh, prosecuted in our country for doing his job as a lawyer is fundamentally unacceptable and our Attorney General did the right thing in dropping the prosecution against Bernard. You should never have been put in that position and I salute you for your courage. Um, we do need to have a good look at Australia's free speech protections. Um, not just, and whistleblowing is an, an essential act in our democracy. Um, free speech and the publication of material in the public interest relies upon whistleblowers and the protection of journalists in receiving information from whistleblowers to hold our government to account. And the prosecution of whistleblowers like David McBride, of lawyers, of journalists, the rating of the ABC is unacceptable. We cannot call ourselves a democracy if we behave like that. Tim Shaw again. Thanks, Laura. Tim Shaw, director of the National Press Club again. Uh, Jennifer, um, Vice President Biden described Julian as a uh, was to the effect a technology terrorist. If you could sit down with his representative here in Australia, uh, Caroline Kennedy, what message would you like Ambassador Kennedy to take to President Biden? I would love to have a sit down meeting with Ambassador Kennedy. And in fact, I invited her here today. <laughs> so um, we would welcome a dialogue with the United States government and we would continue to make the ask that we have asked publicly, which is it's time to drop these charges and to respect the First Amendment of your own country. Is there a good start with the US ambassador in Britain? Uh, I haven't had one one on one or any communication with the ambassador in Britain. Thank you. David Crow. <clears throat> Thanks again, Laura. Um, uh, a moment ago, Mary Kostakidis asked you a question, which I think uh, you, you said you were tired of getting, but, <laughs> but I think needed to be asked, yes. which is, is Julian Assange a journalist? I have another question you're probably also tired of getting, but which, bearing in mind in the room today, we have supporters of Julian Assange clearly, but viewing at home, we may have people who haven't given this issue a lot of thought and still might wonder about the actions of Julian Assange in recent years, because I just Googled this, and of course you can see plenty of assertions that the work that he did helped Vladimir Putin and helped Russia undermine Hillary Clinton, for instance, in the in her presidential campaign. Now, this is an assertion that's often made, and I thought I would put that to you. You mentioned in your speech um, the deal that he declined, but I thought I'd get you to elaborate, if you can, on, on this argument. Uh, it's often claimed that, that he helped Russia and Putin with his activity. What do you say to that? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address that. And just to say, I'm, I'm not tired of the question. I'm tired of hearing journalists say that he's not a journalist, sure. as if that matters. Um, the, speaking about the 2016 election uh, publications, I want to make it very clear. Uh, WikiLeaks was sued in the United States in respect of those publications, and a judge in New York said that those publications had the highest order of protection under the First Amendment to publish information about a political party in the context of an election. That, that uh, uh, publication has the highest order of free speech protection. The New York Times, had they received that material, would have published it. And as Julian has said, if you receive information about a particular political candidate in the context of an election and you choose to sit on it, you are putting your finger on the needle. 
His position is that WikiLeaks should publish, and they published that material, and a judge has recognised in the United States that it deserved protection and was newsworthy. So to say whether it helped politically one way or another, it was in principle an act of journalism that is protected by the First Amendment. Thanks. Maurice Riley. Thanks, Laura. Um, you could be going to the High Court and then the Supreme Court, and, uh, and you know, any time I go to court, uh, I find it an expensive process. I just wonder how you're going to find, how you're going to fund this. You know, uh, who, who, who funds this? You know, this uh, this advocacy at the end of the day, because it's uh, it's got to be people have got to do it. Thank you for asking that question because uh, Julian's Defence has been funded by donations from the public and through fundraising campaigns. We are a huge legal team. I am one of many, um, both in the United Kingdom, in the United States and across Europe who are working to try to protect him. We are up against a superpower. We also have my colleague here in Australia, Stephen Kenny, who I want to acknowledge for his great work for us and, and for David Hicks. So this is an expensive exercise, taking on a superpower the US and the UK is an expensive exercise. So anyone who is minded to support Julian would be very welcome to donate to his to his family and the campaign here in Australia and to the Legal Defence Fund. Do you want to put a figure on it? <laughs> I'm not able to do that. Kim Rubenstein. Kim Rubenstein, Jennifer, um, professor at the University of Canberra and honorary professor at ANU. We've referred to him as being an Australian citizen throughout, and I'm wondering if you can reflect on two things. One, the overall treatment of Australian citizens abroad, not only in these individual circumstances, but the thousands that were stranded during the time of COVID. You may have indeed been one of them. Mm. But also to think strategically about strategic um, litigation here in Australia. And I'm, I'm a guest of the Grata Fund here today, which conducts strategic litigation that you, of course, are aware of. Yes. You'll recall that David Hicks, um, in his time during um, his imprisonment, there was an attempt in the federal court to bring a case of um, testing out those questions about consular assistance and the responsibility of the Australian government for citizens who are detained. Is there some consideration of bringing a like matter against this government in order strategically to put pressure not only on the politics of this, but also of the legal principles of what a state owes its citizens? Thank you, Kim, for your question and for being here and to acknowledge the Grata Fund of which I'm on the board and thank you for your important work. Um, the treatment of Australian citizens is, um, is, I think, a cause for concern. I certainly have had questions about what my Australian passport means, uh, watching what happened to Julian and to for the many thousands of Australians, myself included, who were stranded outside of the country because of our COVID restrictions. That was unlawful. To prevent citizens to return home from their country is unlawful as a matter of international law and we should not have stood for it. And I hope that more Australians here at home will advocate for us as fellow Australians not to be barred from entering our own country. Um, the question about uh, potential litigation here in Australia is really one for my colleague Stephen. Um, and so that's something I'm happy to talk to you about privately. Kathy Vogel. Cathy Vogan, Consortium News. Um, like Mary, I've been reporting from the courtroom for the last three years, uh, roughly, and we've been looking at the case very closely. Now, I want to ask you a question about the High Court appeal. Uh, one of the points that you're appealing is that the US misled uh, the UK courts on the core facts of the case. Um, that seems to be the story of Julian's life, if you've read Professor Milson's book. But could you just very briefly give us a little bit more information about how they have done that? That's it. Thank you. Um, one of our appeal grounds of appeal relates to abusive process um, and the way in which the United States has misrepresented the facts in the indictment in order to justify his extradition. Um, there's, a, there's a number of allegations uh, which have been publicly stated to include hacking. And I wanna make very clear in this room that Julian Assange has not engaged in any form of hacking with respect to that material. He received information from a source just as journalists do all day, every day. Um, there's also an allegation that WikiLeaks was responsible for publishing unredacted material online. 
I also want to make clear that WikiLeaks engaged, and as we did in the evidence before the court, that WikiLeaks engaged in, um, actually pioneered the use of encryption technology to protect the sensitive material that was being shared with media organisations. Pioneered it, and I say that, that these media organisations did not have these protections in place until they started working with WikiLeaks, and that was at Julian's insistence and demand. Now we see it used in all journalism uh, operations around the world. Uh, WikiLeaks engaged in a redaction process with their mainstream media partners, and the reason that the unredacted material ended up published online was because of a security breach by The Guardian news well by journalists at The Guardian, and that was all put in evidence before the court. And in fact, the material was first published by a website in the United States, unredacted. It remains online, and he has never been asked to take it down. So uh, I think when you, when you hear the government's narrative about what WikiLeaks did or didn't do, what Julian is or is not responsible for, I encourage you to look more closely at the facts that we presented in the court. And on that basis, we say that it is an abusive process to seek his extradition, claiming that he is responsible for the damage that was done. Damage which they say, in, and I want to make clear, is an allegation of damage, but there is no allegation, even on the prosecution's own case, that anyone was harmed as a result of WikiLeaks publications. Nick Stewart. In Australia, of course, we don't have any sort of freedom of speech guarantee. Do you think that we're looking at uh, changing the constitution now do you think there's an, any need for that uh, specific freedom of speech, the freedom to publish um, information, if, if it's found or if you genuinely believe it, to allow that so that we can actually uh, produce whatever we, we believe in to be genuinely true? It has long been my publicly stated position that Australia needs a Bill of Rights. We need uh, an explicit right to free speech. Um, we have one implied by the High Court in our constitution. That's not good enough, in my view, and I think our country could benefit from more explicit protections on all range of human rights, but freedom of speech in particular. We're almost out of time, but um, one question I suppose a lot of people would have is, what has happened to WikiLeaks and to the broader sort of idea of being able to you know, have platforms which uh, allow um, the sort of broad dissemination of really big dumps of material such as we saw from WikiLeaks? Well, WikiLeaks is still in operation. Uh, Kristen Raffinson is the um, editor in Julian's stead. Obviously, Julian can't continue to run the organisation from inside a high security prison. Uh, but they are continuing to, to publish and to receive information. And we're seeing more and more these kinds of big global collaborations um, with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists who are replicating really what WikiLeaks first did with their first big publications, massive data publications, sharing among media organisations around the world uh, to make sure that those stories are given context and published in different countries where they're relevant. So I think that is the future of journalism in a global information environment where we are so connected that these stories will continue to be reported on in that way. And I certainly hope to see that WikiLeaks will continue to publish and, and continue to show, you know, take a robust appro approach to publication because I think it pushes the media, the rest of the media to do better. Has it changed the sort of mechanisms and processes um, through which things like the International Consortium work though, do you think, that what's happened to Julian Assange? I think, well, I think they have all learned from what WikiLeaks did because they're replicating that in terms of the global collaborations. I think, I think journalists are concerned about what this prosecution means and are, are cautious. Um, and, are, and that's a problem. We're seeing a chilling of national security journalism. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Jen Robinson.